good morning and welcome to Southridge Church. We're so glad that you're here this morning in person or joining us online. Uh, either way, we're grateful to worship with you today. What a great opportunity we have to be together and to just give God some glory for who he is. And it's just going to be a great day here at Southridge. It's going to be a great day with you, a great day with God. A couple things we want you to be aware of is we are continuing Impact Schools where we're preparing several boxed meals uh, or boxed pantry items to send with families during the holiday season. If you uh, want to partner with us in that, make sure you bring your items in this week. You can bring them in on Sunday. This week we're looking for large boxes of cereal and brownie mix. You guys are right on point with that. We've seen a lot of really great um, supplies come in, but we want to keep doing it. So you know, we don't have to just meet the goal that we set. We can go beyond that, right, for our community and for the people um, that we love because we say it, we'll say it again. God loves people and so do we. So we want to make sure we can do that the best we can. This morning, if you didn't already, make sure you grab one of these on your way in. Uh, we're going to be doing a special opportunity of communion today. In addition, this coming weekend, we are hosting the Youth Bazaar right here in our facility. It's going to be social distance friendly. You can come out and do your shopping, come out and support the youth, come out and support crafters. If you're a crafter, you know a crafter, you know this year's been particularly difficult. So come out and show your support for that event this coming Saturday. If you want to partner with Southridge Church through giving, you can text give, you can go online, src.life slash giving to give, or you can give here in person the black box on your way out today. If you're new to Southridge Church, I want to say thank you for giving us a try. Thank you for seeing, uh, giving yourself a chance to see a church that truly cares about our community, cares about families, and wants to see people connected to God. In case you're not sure, our mission here is to be the perfect place for imperfect people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And you can see more of our mission and our vision by going to src.life. You can also check out the sermon notes for today. By going there, you can fill out a connect card if you're new here. And if you're watching virtually online, be aware in the comments section for things like sermon points and lyrics as we sing and worship God. Before we go into worship, let's pray. God, thank you so much for being a God we can come to when our life is going amazing to give you praise. Thank you for being a God we can come to when our life is just hitting the pits and you lift us up. Jesus, in this moment, I pray God that we can draw near to you as you desperately desire to be near to us. God, allow our worship to put a smile on your face. Let us grow in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand up and worship. We're excited that you're here.
you are grateful for God's love. God's love bringing us to life, taking ourselves and our feet out of the grave and giving us a purpose. If you believe that, let's worship him this morning. Amen.
let's lift up a shout of praise in the house this morning. Good morning, good morning, church. We're about ready to move in time, uh, into our time of communion here at Southridge Church. Um, we believe in open communion here, meaning that if you are a believer of Jesus, we invite you uh, to come and uh, have communion with us. Uh, that being said, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, the little thing that you have has two openings. The top has a, a little wafer in it, and the bottom has some juice in it. Um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll move into a song, and um, you can take this at any point in time. And this is a time for you to reflect on uh, your walk uh, with Jesus, where you're at in your relationship. And I want to share a quick uh, verse uh, about this. I was really excited when Scott uh, asked me uh, if I would uh, do this. And I'm real excited because I get to share this here with you. Um, this is from uh, Luke 22, uh, chapter 15. Um, Jesus said, um, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Um, so to set this up, Jesus and his friends are all uh, sitting around uh, at this Passover dinner. And Jesus knows that he's about ready to be crucified. And he knows that one of his friends that's in the room is going to be trained. And he's still excited because even, even when we're his enemy, Jesus loves us, right? So why do we do this communion? It, it goes on, um, and he, he talks about uh, the bread, and it represents his body that he's giving up in a sacrifice. And he talks about how uh, the wine that they were drinking uh, represents the blood that he's going to pour out for us. And then he asked, he says, do this just to remember. Mm. To his friends. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for loving somebody like me. Thank you for loving us as we're unlovable. Thank you for your sacrifice. And I remember you, God. We love you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.
nobody else to the left or to the right of you. Just begin to pray to him, to worship him for who he is. God, I love you.
Good morning. It's always something. That's all right. That's all right. All right, well, two things before I forget, um, because I always forget stuff whenever I'm preaching. First off, that was beautiful, um, watching you all sing and lift your hands to the Lord. That was beautiful. That was just a holy moment of communion, singing the old hymn. That was just beautiful. Thank you, worship team, so much uh, for that. Second off, I was sitting in the uh, green room uh, in between services, and I'm watching other um, live streams from around the country and stuff, and um, the Lord said, uh, we're going to give away turkeys for Thanksgiving. I know all the staff, elders, everyone's like, no, we're not. We haven't talked about that yet. He just said that in between services. So I just want to let you know what we're going to do is 10% of the offering that comes in this weekend will go to buy turkeys for people in our community. So um, if you're not normally a giver but you want to give to that, that would be fantastic. But we're gonna, uh, we'll figure out some way to figure out who's in need. We're going to buy turkeys for people that are in need um, with 10% of the offering that comes in today. So those of you watching online, if you, you can give at src.life slash giving. With that being said, let's get into our week three of The Proof is in the Pudding. How many of you have ever seen the show My 600-Pound Life? Anybody? 600 pound life if you're watching online make sure that you interact with us how many of you really like that show like really i love watching that show like whenever we go over to my family's house and they have cable i always love to turn it on and all of them are like i don't want to watch that show or whatever it is like they're so they don't want to watch it at all but i love it i can't figure out why i love it but I was thinking this past week, maybe it's because I love a good story of transformation. Like, I really like watching, like, at the beginning, where they start, and then, like, if they will really do what Dr. Nalzara Dan tells them to do, and they follow the process, like, their lives really will be drastically different at the end of it. And it's, it's I just love this whole idea of transformation. Now, what we don't see in an hour-long program is that it doesn't just take an hour to get from beginning to end for these folks. I mean, it's a, at least a year-long process, 18 months, two years, and then the maintenance of it all, that's a lifelong commitment. See, any sort of transformation in someone's life is the uh, product of lifelong commitment, lifelong commitment to a process. I want you to think just for a moment, if there's something in your life Those of you watching online, make sure that you think about this. Is there something in my life right now that a year from now I would hope is drastically different? Is there something in my life right now that I would like to be different a year from now? My guess is no matter what you fill in that blank with, that I wanted to do this, that there's a process that has to be followed for that to happen. And you can't just do it for like two or three days. It has to be a commitment over a long time. So in the Proof is in the Pudding series, we've been talking about how our life has to be the proof of our faith. If your faith doesn't affect how you live, then you don't actually have the faith that you claim to have. Faith in Jesus is always transformative. Nobody that ever came in contact with Jesus ever stayed the same. Right, so uh, when the blind man encounters Jesus, he walks away with sight. When the one that can't walk encounters Jesus, he walks away jumping, leaping, dancing, whatever he wants to do. Nobody comes into contact with Jesus and ever stays the same. And so that's what we've been talking about so far in this series is if we say that we have faith, there should be some proof of that in our life. It's far too easy to just say we have faith if it's not actually changing us. So this morning, I want to talk to you about transformation and how do I make sure that my life is the proof of my faith? What is the lifelong journey of transformation really look like? I'm gonna give you three steps for that this morning. I'm not always a big three-step person, but I keep coming back to that a lot in this season. And so I've got you a three-step process that I see very clearly in James Chapter 1, if you'll start with me, James chapter 1, beginning verse 21, it says this. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. 
Now, this doesn't sound like the most encouraging thing in the world for someone to say to you, because first off, for this to apply to you, you would have to admit to the fact that there is filth and evil in your lives, and there's always about half of us that think there's no way that could ever be true of me. I'm far too good for you to classify anything within me as filth or evil. But what we've been talking a lot about over the last couple of months is how this is true of all of us. This is true of all of us. This is, a, at the very least, this is all of our starting point. The filth and the evil, it's like, there's, some of us, we get this really easy. Some of you, you walked in church this morning, or you turned on the live feed, and you're like, I can't believe the building didn't fall down around me when I walked in here. Because some of you, you're like, that describes me to a T. The, the holier than thou's go, not me. But this is all of our starting point. It's all of our starting point. And James isn't saying this to be mean. He, he's actually about to say, I've got a way for you to get rid of it. There's hope. There's hope for transformation. There's hope that what's true of you right now, that you might be full of filth and evil, doesn't have to be true of you in the future. There's hope for transformation, is what James is saying. Getting rid of all filth and evil, that's one of those things that's like, James, that is way easier said than done, man. That's a hard thing. It's like weighing 600 pounds and then trying to weigh 200 pounds. I mean, it's hard. And James uses this really common motif in the New Testament of clothing. He, he says that you're going to have to take something off to put something on. Now, there's another New Testament writer. His name was Paul. He was a former Christian hater, ends up meeting Jesus, now loves Jesus, and started uh, introducing Jesus to all kinds of people in the first century. He writes something very similar in Colossians chapter 3, but when he does it, he says, you need to take off, and he starts getting real specific. He's like anger and envy and malice and all this. He lists them real specific, and then he goes, and now put on this, love and compassion, all these things. He's very specific. James says, take off evil and filth, but rather than filling in all the blanks, he says, there's something, there's an influence I can point you to that can take care of all of the specifics. I will walk you through in a lifetime of all the specifics that Paul has given in a different place. What is this influence? What is this thing that James points us to is the, that, that is the means by which we get rid of all filth and evil in your lives? Let, let, let's just start here. Do you want to get rid of all evil and filth in your life? Amen? Okay, because if not, then, I mean, just turn off the stream, go home, whatever. This won't help you. But if you're like me, and if you're like any other sincere believer, you want to get rid of the evil and filth in your life, how do I do it? Here's what James says, second part of this verse. Humbly accept the word God has planted in your heart, for it has the power to save your soul. Here's the key. For a life to be transformed, it must be immersed in the reading, the studying, and the hearing of of the Word of God. And here's the issue. Studies would say that we live in the most biblically illiterate society that has ever existed since the time the Bible was written. Studies would also say that you very good people that right now are occupying a nice little maroon seat at 100 Eagle Drive, and those of you watching online, chances are since the last time that you were here, you didn't open your Bibles. And that's the great divide between where I am and where I want to be. Nobody goes to see doctor now on my 600-pound life and goes, every time they show up, they're like, nothing's happening. Well, are you working the plan? Are you doing the things you need to do to see the result? And statistics would say, most of you in this room, most of you watching online, have not opened your Bible the past seven days. And it is the reason why you are not experiencing transformation in your spiritual life. So what does it look like to humbly accept the Word of God? First off, that means that the Word of God, what God has to say about the world, is authoritative in my life. It means that where I differ 
from the word, in my opinion, in my actions, in my beliefs, in, in it, where the my political party disagrees with the word, and, and where my best friend disagrees, and, and where I disagree, I have to come to the place where the Bible is authoritative, and I say, when the scriptures and I disagree, I am wrong. I must change. But I'm like, we're getting really good now in today's day and age of trying to change the scriptures to meet what we want it to say. But coming under the authority of scripture means that if it says this, it means this, I believe this, even if I have to admit that I'm wrong. So when my life, my worldview, my political view, my personal opinion, my feelings disagree with the word, it's not the word that's wrong. It's me that has to come under the authority. So my kids, we found this out over the last couple of years, they are really big fans of buffets. Anybody else a buffet fan? Let us know what your favorite buffet is if you're watching online. But our kids, because we lived in Cross Lanes for a while, loved Golden Corral. Loved it. And we loved it too whenever they were, I think it was under five, they were free. So it was amazing. But what we loved about it is because we have really picky eaters, as most kids probably are. Like you can go and you can get a bite of all their favorite things and the things that they don't like for one dinner that week, we don't have to sit there and fight with them. Oh, you don't like that? Just don't get it. You don't like And unfortunately, that's how a lot of people come to the scriptures, right? It's like, like oh, I, I love this stuff about love and grace. I love this stuff about hope and a future. I love this stuff about how God loves me and, and he forgives my sins. But this, I, I really don't like God's narrow-mindedness when it comes to um, sex, I really don't like God's insistence on me loving my enemies. I really don't like this whole thing about forgiveness. That like, because God, you don't know what they did to me. You, you don't know how my mom walked out on me. You, you don't know about how my dad abused me. And no, I may not know the depths of your pain. But Jesus does. And if he calls you to it, don't you think he'll strengthen you to, 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 to forgive? It's like whatever the scriptures present, God's going to give you the grace to do what it is that needs to be done. So it can't be a buffet that goes, oh, I really like this part, but I'm going to reject this part. I like this part. You either come under the totality of the scriptures or you don't come at all. It's not pick and choose things that, oh, well, my political party really likes this. They don't like this, so I'll just minimize this and go with this. It doesn't work like that. You take it all, and you find a way to bring your life into alignment with it. Now, here's my other warning before we move on. This is written, once again, James is writing to believers, this is not a sermon about how non-believers, those of you that you're not in relationship with the Lord, this is not a, a sermon about how you need to believe the Bible. This is about how people that say that they have encountered Jesus, how they need to bring their lives into alignment with the Bible. So before you start going, oh, he's talking to non-believers this morning. He's talking to people that are far from God. No, he's talking to the church that has to come under the authority of Scripture. He's actually not talking to non-believers at all today. Non-believers, if you're watching, if you're not, in a, you're not a Christian yet, you're just checking this whole thing out, this right here, I'm not saying that this is for you. This gives you like a nice little insight into what it would look like if you chose to follow Jesus. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have to come under the authority of Scriptures. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you claim that, you better believe that you have to. Not optional. Now, James here is also not saying that you could figure out some formula in the scriptures that if I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, then I'm going to be saved. It's not a works based salvation. 
James is not saying that we do what the Bible says, bring our lives into alignment with it to be saved. He says that if you are saved, this is what you will do. Not works-based, not that you can earn it, but rather if you have truly encountered Jesus, this is what it looks like to follow him. Verse 22 says this. Take our next step now. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. So the first step was that I need to receive or accept the word. The evidence of receiving and accepting the word is in the doing of the word. It's in the doing of it. Remember what we said, for a life to be transformed, it must be immersed in the reading, the studying, and the hearing of the word. Well, that right there, it can't stop there. We have to read, study, and hear it. And then just, James says, and then do it, or you're fooling yourself. He's saying, if you don't do it, then you haven't really received it. This is something I'm going to hit on next week, but I want to preference a little bit about spiritual disciplines and how spiritual disciplines are absolutely necessary. When I say spiritual disciplines, I'm talking about reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, serving, giving, all these sorts of deals that we do that, that help us to receive the grace of God to live out the Word of God. But sometimes spiritual disciplines can be the downfall of a believer because they teach you to live for a check mark rather than to live for true change. They treat, like, and I'll just be honest, I am a huge check mark person. Like, I, I do, everything that I do for work is in a to-do list, and I love whenever I can click the little check mark, it comes across the screen like a big wave of a check mark. I love that. My Bible app, I'm reading the Bible in a year right now. I love whenever I read a chapter, boom, check mark. But sometimes those spiritual disciplines don't actually amount to change because we're just living for the check mark and not for the change. See, what I'm really longing for is not a church that can tell me what the Bible says, but a church that can show me what it says. And that's what culture right now surrounding us is interested in. Not a church that can stand up and tell you what the Bible says, but a church that can go out and live in a way that even people that have never read the Bible would understand what some of the key tenets of it are just by watching you live. Could you imagine a new neighbor moving in next to you? They come from an island far away. They've never heard of Jesus, never heard of the Bible, Never even heard of Christianity. But you lived in such a way in front of them. They say, you know what? This thing that you adhere your life to, I want to guess that it says a lot about generosity just by the way that you live. I bet it says something about how you should love your enemies. I, like, could you imagine someone that's never read the Bible being able to tell you about the Bible based on the way that you live your life? That's what it looks like to truly follow Jesus. Not just be able to tell you what the Bible says, but to actually be able to do it. See, like, like knowing the word is not equal to doing the word. And, and knowing the word and doing spiritual disciplines, reading your Bible, getting the check mark, doing your prayer, coming to church, is not equal to actually being born again. Because there are plenty of people that do that that are not going to spend eternity with Jesus. Here's a great example. When I was in second grade, I was recognized as one of the best Bible quizzers for my denomination here in Charleston growing up. So much that my home church flew me to San Antonio to be in a Bible quiz faced off with people literally from around the world. And if my memory does not fail me, at this international Bible quiz, I missed two questions. Second grade, here's the issue. I didn't get saved till I was 23. <laughs> I'm telling you, in college, 
I would have Bible debates, theology debates with people that I could blow them out of the water. I could blow any Christian out of the water, and yet I was not saved. Because spiritual disciplines, just coming to church, just reading my Bible is not the same as truly knowing Jesus. It's just not. And if I want true change, I have to be a doer. I have to do something. If you're, if you're kind of stuck and you're going, why, am I, why is there nothing changing in me? Why is my values not changing? Why are my actions, my words, the things I think, why are they not changing? Here's why. You're not doing the word. You might be hearing it. You may be very faithful to show up online or in person. You may be very faithful every morning to open up the Bible app and read a chapter. You may be very faithful at that. But if you're not doing it, then you're really not getting it. So, so, good example of this. When I was in high school, I was a baseball player. And during the off season, we would go to Nautilus, which is a gym here in the area, all winter long. And so I went every day after school with two other guys. Month after month, these two guys kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger. This one guy, he was even younger than me. Like, he's starting to get this, like, ripped six-pack. Biceps are starting to bulge out. I'm like, that's awesome. So I started, like, thinking, like, what's the, why are these two guys seeing these huge gains in the gym, and I'm going every single day, and nothing's happening? Here was the difference. When I went to the gym, it was my social hour as you might be able to tell. I was far more concerned with walking around and talking to everyone, and I would hop on a, a machine every once in a while and do something, but, like, I wasn't doing the workout that the coach gave us. And these other two guys were, which is why they were further along than me and closer to where they ultimately wanted to be, and I wasn't, even though I was putting in the time, I wasn't doing the work. And that describes a lot of people that attend church faithfully. You've been doing, putting in the time, but not putting in the work. Okay, I came to the realization this week, because I'm doing a Bible in a year plan where I'm trying to read the whole Bible. I said, I shouldn't have done that. But rather than read the whole Bible in a year, I should have committed to living the Bible in a year. I, I should like... Instead of living for the check mark, I should have lived for the change. And I really miss that this year. I can see it in my life. I can see it in the ways that I've been failing, that I've been more living for the check mark rather than the change. I've been seeing that pop up all over. I actually think maybe this January, as you start thinking, what am I going to do this year? What, what am I going to try to be like this year? Come January, you would be better off to choose one Bible verse to read every single day and put it into practice than to read the whole Bible in 2021 and not do anything. What if we did that? I just choose one thing. Like, just know, you know your biggest failure, the area of biggest temptation. What if you chose one verse that spoke to that? And for 365 straight days, you read it, you meditated on it, you wrestled with it, and then you sought every day. How do I put this into practice? How do I live this out? What if your devotional time was more than just sitting quietly somewhere and you going and doing something? I mean, this is true Christian transformation. Maybe we do that next year. One verse a day. Or one verse for the year. Forget the chapter a day thing. One verse, live it out. James moves on now, 23. He says, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. So now James moves to this illustration of a mirror. And he said, if you only hear but you don't do, you're like a person that you see yourself, and you may even notice something's off. 
But when you walk away, you forget about that thing. So like this morning, as I'm getting ready for church, I had to, to shave my head. I'm shaving, getting it all down like yes. And then I'm checking in the mirror. Is there anything that's not as it should be? You guys know what that's like before you head out? Ladies, gentlemen, I know that there's, like, some of you guys, you spend longer in front of a mirror than the ladies, okay? But what are you doing when you look in the mirror? Does everything look okay? Does everything look okay? And that's, what, that, that's the point of the Bible. It serves as a mirror. As we read it, we're checking it with our lives and going, does everything look okay? Does everything look okay? Is there any hair that's out of place? Is there anything that is not as it should be? Have you ever wanted to forget what you saw in the mirror? Yeah. I'll never forget. I'll never forget seventh grade. Getting this stupid, stupid idea that I would bleach my hair to look like Eminem. Those of you, uh, and that, I just realized as I was prepping this morning, that's a joke that might miss a ton of people. Because some of y'all, y'all are still too old to know who Eminem was. Some of you, now you're too young to know who Eminem was. <laughs> Either way, he had bleach blonde hair, and I thought, that would be a good idea. So every morning, seventh grade, walk into the bathroom, and it was one of these deals. And walking away, I'm like, man, I hope I forget what I look like so I can get a little confidence in my step when I'm walking through the halls. And about the time that I start feeling good about myself, it's because I forgot what I looked like. Because then I would go to the restroom and I'd see that mirror and I'd be reminded that I look ridiculous. James says, if you only hear but you don't do, you're the one with bleach blonde hair. You're the one that looks like a fool. You're the one that looks ridiculous. Here's what scares me so much about the rhythms that we've picked up in life. That here we are for an hour on a Sunday, whether in this room, whether watching at home or at work or listening to a podcast. But after you click X or I dismiss you to leave in about 20 minutes... You're going to go to lunch. You're going to pick up lunch. You're going to remember, oh, the kids got this project due tomorrow. We've got to go home. We've got to do laundry. Or those of you watching at home, you're sitting right beside the laundry, and you're like, I've got to take care of that eventually. Then we've got to fix lunch. And we, all of this. And anything that you get confronted with while you're here quickly disappears because of everything else you've got going on in life. You come here, you open up the Word, you see yourself in the mirror clearly, and because you're so busy, you leave and you forget what you saw. So very rarely do you ever do anything about the things that you hear. It's almost like not being here. It's almost like not watching. That really scares me as a pastor that, like, you could really be dealing with something in here and then go to lunch and forget. This, this is why I'm so insistent. Those of you that you're not in a life group, you're missing out on the second chance to get confronted with what you're confronted with in the sermon. If you're not in a small group, then only you can hold yourself accountable for what you hear when you're here. Only you can do that. Then if you don't have daily spiritual disciplines of reminding yourself what you dealt with in church or in your Bible study, then all of it will be for nothing. This is why I provide for you notes every single week. You can either take them yourself or you can go to src.life, take notes every week, because they're meant for you to look at them daily and be reminded, what was I confronted with? What was I confronted with? What do I need to work on? What do I need to focus on? See, if you're not taking notes, how are you going to be reminded? 
How are, you, how are you going to have those times where you look in the mirror and go, what's out of place? The reason why we don't take notes, the reason why we don't go to a small group and be confronted once again with the truth that we've been faced with is because we're not actually after the change, we're after the check mark. I came to church, I watched the live stream, I read my Bible, but we didn't let it read us. We didn't let it change us. See, without the doing, it's as if you didn't hear anything at all. It's as if you didn't hear anything at all. Last week, this past week, I got more comments, more nice notes, emails, messages on Facebook from you all about my sermon last week than I've ever received before. More positive feedback about a sermon than I've ever had, and I've been preaching for almost nine years now. And then as I was prepping this week, I'm getting all these nice messages, and I thought, I'm glad that they liked the sermon. I'm glad they liked it. But what would be even more encouraging as a pastor is if they lived it. I, I, I love that you all like the sermons, which normally means that I just said plenty of things that didn't offend you. And I said it in a way that eventually you would laugh every once in a while. You're like, oh, he's not such a bad guy. You like it, but do you live it? I was thinking this past week, okay, last week, what did we talk about? We talked about prejudice and the, to, to fight against prejudice, we need to go and fight for those that are oppressed and marginalized. How many of you did something? How many of you did something? Don't raise your hands. Don't respond. I'm just a rhetorical question. We liked the sermon so much that I got more feedback than I've ever had. If you lived it out, send me a message. Hey, this is what I did. This is how I helped the marginalized. This is how I helped the oppressed. Now, I will say, I did see people's uh, social medias make a drastic shift, which was kind of nice. My guess is in a couple weeks, you'll be back to the whole thing. But that's, I mean, that's okay. I'm just saying. What we have a tendency to do, though, is take the easy road on application. Because it, it's super easy just not to hit the share button. It's harder for you to sit down at your computer and find a ministry here in the Charleston area that is fighting for the oppressed and say, I'll give you a gift, I'll show up and serve. Easy not to hit the share button, much more difficult to actually get yourself in the game and do something. And I was guilty of it. Wednesday, here I am, I'm writing this sermon. Don't just be a hearer. For me, it's, it, sometimes it's, don't just be a, a speaker of the word. Be a doer of the word. Scott, what did you do? Well, I hadn't really thought of it. What did I do? I preached the message. What, what? Well, I was like, I can't, I can't do much right now. But did you do anything? And I was like, no, I didn't. So I started thinking, okay, God, what is a way that I could easily touch someone that is oppressed and marginalized so I can live this out? Because I'm not saying that living this out is something like always some huge drastic step. Sometimes it's just something really small that you start getting in a rhythm of living out the sermon. And so I remembered back in August we had Compassion Sunday where my family and I are now sponsoring a four-year-old little boy from Tanzania. Fifty people from this church on Compassion Sunday signed up to sponsor kids, which is awesome. Our goal is to have 250 kids eventually as a church. If you want to get in on that, if you want that to be the way that you're touching the oppressed and the marginalized, go to src.life, and then there's a compassion link there. Go to compassion that way. That way you make sure you get a kid in Tanzania because that's our focus is the country of Tanzania. So we started doing that. We've made two or three months now of uh, sponsorship payments. But I thought, what, what can I do? And I said, oh, I forgot I can send letters. I can send letters. And so 
through our partnership with Compassion, you can actually download the app onto your phone and send letters back and forth between you and your child. So when I finally logged into Compassion, we had a letter from Shibilu waiting on us. And it told us that he likes art, that he's in kindergarten. And I said, okay, this is something I can do. This is how I can live out the sermon. So I sent Shabilu a letter. I said, hey, we just started being your sponsors. My name is Scott. My wife's name is Megan. We have kids, Landon and Olivia. And Shabilu, we want you to know that we love you. I said, I want you to know that my kids picked you out of all the other packets that picked you. And we love you. We're praying for you. It was that simple. Now there's a kid in Tanzania that's going to get that letter and say, hey, somebody cares about me. I can be more than a criminal. I can do something more with my life. What did you do with the sermon last week? Wouldn't it be super frustrating if I refused to preach anything new until you've all done it? That'd be so, like, if, like you guys would eventually just go to some other church or tune into another stream. And you know what? I wouldn't be the one that was wrong. Verse 25. It says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then... God will bless you for doing it. There's a blessing tied to obedience. There's a blessing tied to you living out the word. The doer lets it sink in. What we hear, we let it sink in. We process it with friends in small groups. We process it on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday. Until we live it out. We process it. We marinate it. I mean, you guys know that there's a drastic difference in a steak that you just, like, throw some stuff on before you throw it on the grill and a steak that's been sitting in a marinade all day. You know that there's a drastic difference just in the way that it tastes. There's a drastic difference in the life of a Christian that just hears and then one that lets the word marinate in their life. There's a huge difference. Huge difference. And that word look in verse 25, it actually means to investigate. I mean, it, it has this picture of, you ever like watch those crime shows or whatever and they come up and there's like a dead body or some sort of evidence and they don't just come up and like glance at it like, huh, and like walk away. Right, they get their magnifying glass, they hunch over, they get down on it, they're taking notes, like everything, I want to know everything there is to know about this piece of evidence. That's the word that's being used when it says look. But you can't wrestle with things, you can't let it marinate if you're only living for the check mark. It'll never get deep enough if we're only living for the check mark. We have to live for the change. I, I have tried since I began preaching to covenant with myself and with God that I will not preach a sermon that I'm not willing to live out. I'm not perfect at doing that. But I'll keep trying. But my challenge to you, would you not listen to a sermon that you won't covenant to try and live out? Because I would rather, listen to me, I love you this much to tell you this, I would rather the online views go to zero and the attendance here go to zero if we're only going to like stuff but not live it. I don't do what I do for the audience to see how many people I can get to watch me. It's because I love you. I want something more for your life than what you're settling for. You, you found religion, the check marks. You know it was the religious people that killed Jesus, right? 
James is saying we have to examine our lives up against the word. It's a it's a routine checkup. See, when we examine ourselves, normally we find someone else that's more messed up than us, and we judge ourselves based off of them, and then we start feeling really good about ourselves. Rather than looking into the perfect law and going, wow, against that, I really don't measure up. Take heart, though. I don't, I don't either. But that's how you find transformation. Don't look at flawed people and go, oh, I'm better than them. Look at the perfect word and say, I've got a lot of work to do. I've got a lot of work to do. It's a regular checkup. Just like, I mean, you go to the doctor yearly, right? Wow, to make sure everything's okay. So what's the three-step process, the transformation? We just went through it, but let's put words to it that you'll be able to remember. Receive it. Do it, review it. Receive it, do it, review it. Just like sit my 600-pound life, they show up. I'm not going to listen to Dr. Now if I don't think that he has my best interest at heart. If I don't think that he really knows what he's doing, I'm not going to listen. But if I do think so, then I'll receive what he says. Here's, here's the plan. Okay, I'll receive that. And then they have to go off and they have to do it. But every once in a while, they have to show up to review it. He'll say, hey, are you, you doing the diet? You doing the exercises? Well, let's find out. Step up on the scale. Receive it, do it, review it. Receive it, do it, review it. Okay, I read a passage on forgiveness. I know that I'm supposed to forgive. So I go and find those that I still have issues with in my heart. I begin to work through that. And then daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, I review it. How, how am I doing? How am I doing with forgiveness? How am I doing with generosity? How am I doing with loving my enemies? How am I doing with treating people fairly and equally and fighting for justice? How am I doing? Receive it, do it, review it. Put that somewhere that you can find it. Put that on the front of your Bible. Put it on your cell phone. That way you'll never open up the Bible again without thinking, I have to receive it, I have to do it, I have to review it. There has to be a process. So here's the question today. How committed to the Word are you? How committed to transformation are you? Because if so, living for the check mark is not going to work. Living for the check mark is not going to ever bring about the change that you're looking for and the transformation that you're looking for. How committed to the Word are you? Let me talk to those in the room today and those watching online that this is really far from you because you're going, I, I'm not a follower of Jesus. I, I'm not a Christian. And you said this wasn't for me. Okay, now I want to talk to you. Because this sermon is for believers, I want to make sure that you understand something. Don't let the Bible be the hurdle that you have to jump over to get to Jesus. If, if there's some stuff in the Bible that you're like, I don't know. I don't know if I can believe that. I don't know if I can get down with that. Don't let that be the hurdle to you getting to Jesus. That all gets worked out in the discipleship process. If you want to receive salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, eternity with Jesus, all you have to do is by faith look to Jesus today. Don't let the Bible stand in the way. We'll handle all of that in the discipleship process. Don't let, don't let your views on this or that stand in the way. Just look to Jesus today. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that you would do what only you can do. That's transform our lives. Change us, God. Make us new. We pray, God, as a church that we would never just hear the word, but we would always seek to do the word. We ask, God, as a church that you would make us a light in our community because we choose to do your will and your word. Help us to humbly accept what you've said to us today, but help us to never only hear. Help us to do. In Jesus' name.
باش
for joining us, whether here in the room or online. Just one final reminder, we are going to give 10% of all of our offering today um, towards turkeys for those in our community. So if you haven't yet given, want to give, um, or if you want to give specifically towards that above and beyond, just make a note or somehow or, or give it online uh, designated to missions. We'll make sure that we buy as many turkeys as we possibly can um, out of those funds uh, for those in the community that are in need. So that's just a quick reminder. You can give online at src.life slash giving. Those of you watching from wherever you're at on the other side of that camera, it's been a pleasure to have you. I hope you have a fantastic week. Those of you here in the room, if you'll hang out with us.